just want to say, um, first of all, my name is Mary Oliver. Um, I'm uh, director of the Performance Research Centre here and have been involved with the development of the Digital Performance Lab, which is where we just were for a number of years, um, uh, way before we opened this campus, um, with, the, with the vision that it would be an interdisciplinary, inquisitive laboratory that would bring uh, artists, scientists, um, basically investigators from different disciplines together, and just to see what would happen when we, when we gave the possibility of, of those kinds of different um, convergences, uh, the possibility of taking place. And I think the Screen Lab has been a perfect example of what happens um, when we actually take the risk uh, and invest um, in this possibility, um, because artists aren't afraid of not knowing. And I think that's one of the, um, the, the key differences between the artist and the scientist, that they're comfortable with the unknown. And, but when they come together, something really quite beautiful and extraordinary can happen and something and can have um, a real long-lasting effect um, in, in the sense of developing new innovations and things that are as yet impossible uh, to imagine at this present point in time. The whole purpose of this series is to take that idea forward and we've had people like Kevin Warwick, cyberneticist, who was the first man to have um, a, an implant um, uh, um, grafted into his, his body. Um, we've had Steve Benford, uh, who uh, sci computer scientist who's talked about uh, future entertainment as that which um, embraces people's discomfort, manipulates it and makes it um, uh, very personal, uh, which is something I wouldn't um, myself enjoy, but, um, but I, I know people who get a kick out of those kind of things. Um, anyway, um, yeah, not mentioning any names. Um, so, um, so, but, so, first of all, I just want to thank um, Kit and Elliot um, for, for having the courage and uh, the conviction to, to put this uh, into place. This is the second Screen Lab, and, and um, I hope that this is the first of, of many. Thanks to the Arts Council, who had the courage to, uh, to support it. And, um, and lastly, uh, thanks to all the artists who've, uh, who've been with us and, and, and made this magical, really wondrous, magical work happen. And uh, now on to the next stage, as part the as yet impossible part of this, um, this which is to talk about um, effective ways of creating environments and where this kind of, um, uh, of creative processes can happen. And I'd like to introduce our three presenters uh, this evening, Drew Hemant. Um, for those of you who don't know Drew, I can't believe that there's nobody in the audience that, <laughs> that doesn't know him, uh, CEO of um, um, a Future Everything, um, and an artist, curator, and has clearly made the impossible happen with Future Everything. It's just grown from strength to strength. Um, so welcome, Drew. Um, Steve Simons, who's, um, yes, amongst other things, is, um, a sound artist. Um, and uh, and a part of the award-winning uh, group that created the Owl Project. And lastly, oh, this is where I'm going to really stumble. Philip Vishnik, is that how you say your name? Oh, the um, Philip, Philip seems to be one of those um, uh, people who just sums up the whole aspect of these collaborations because he's an architect, a lecturer. And did it say poet somewhere then? Oh, he's everything but a poet, Someday. apparently. Yes. <laughs> Just for tonight. So we, we want poems later. <laughs> Thank you. So welcome, everyone. So uh, I can waffle, and I'll be told not to talk too long. And uh, Elliot and Kit specifically uh, told me, uh, told me, uh, to uh, limit myself to uh, my sort of art practice and not talk about future everything, uh, which I feel a bit of a sham because I'm a fake artist. I'm not really an artist, just sometimes I pretend to be one. Um, now I'm going to start with an interactive uh, section of my, of my short presentation. Um, and I'm just going to talk about some of my sort of influences and interests in network culture. I want you to look at these network diagrams and tell me which year they came from and what they represent. Don't be shy now, come on. Uh, Fenman diagrams from 47. Close. Uh, the, the, Darbonet. 
The, these are actually <laughs> these are actually doodles by uh, an old um, flatmate of mine from 1990, and he was he was doodling. He's representing. I was involved in in music back then in the late 80s and early 90s, and he was doodling the, the networks of, of electronic music. And some of these are quite uncanny because I mean that looks like a a street grid, a street network. And this was in uh, this was in 1990, and in, in the sort of early 90s, I got involved in digital culture, and a lot of the kind of interest I had, I mean, this was all about, uh, you know, networks of, you know, electronic musicians collaborating over space and time, independent labels, uh, free parties, we used to hack urban infrastructure, we used to go in a warehouse and take a power lead from a, um, you know, a, a lamp post, you know, I had friends who went to prison for dishonest abstra abstraction of electricity, we were literally hacking urban infrastructure and then digital sort of stuff came around and and I found a whole another set of infrastructure to play with and uh, sort of a decade later uh, I got very interested in sort of mobile and, and geolocative sort of locative media stuff as, as we called it at the time and a lot of the, the people I, I bumped into were really excited about this and I was terrified uh, of just being trapped all the time so so one project uh, I did in sort of sort of started 2004, presented it in 2006, was called Loka, and we basically set up a, uh, a Bluetooth network around the city, um, just by you know, some old phones, um, some old, you know, had a production line of batteries, and we hid them under sort of, uh, you know, bar terraces and in flower pots in hotels and up lampposts, covered the city in these nodes, and we basically tracked people as they'd, they'd move through the city, oh, a bit pixelated, and um, through information on where they were, send them messages. We were reading the semantics of the city and sending them messages relevant to where they'd been um, and their, their patterns of movement. Um, and, and, and basically we kind of set up this sort of uh, fake fictional social network that people went, you know, sort of might have signed up to by mistake and we actually involved them in this surveillance network uh, over the length of this festival. <laughs> Um, and on the last day of the festival, one of our nodes was discovered uh, by hotel staff hidden in a flower pot, and they called the police. <laughs> and this was arrest. This was taken away, and was taken to the police station and carried on capturing data. So we got everyone <laughs> entering and leaving the police station. As well. <laughs> <laughs> so, so after then, I, I, I was sort of more interested in sort of urban interfaces and, and hacking cities. Um, a lot of stuff around sort of. Uh, social sensing and sort of citizens generating data about cities. Got very involved, and this is, this is an ongoing big area of interest uh, sort of more recently in, in open data, um, developing communities around open data, developing infrastructure. We set up the, the Greater Manchester Data Store. And for me, this is like, uh, you know, I don't know what you'd call it, sort of open data policy. For me, it's an artwork. It's an experiment. It's a provocation. It's like what would happen if cities... You know, if, 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 if data was made open, and we, we really ran this project as as an artwork. Out of that, we got I got very interested in, in issues of data literacy uh, and data art. And the project that uh, Kit and Elliot asked me to say a few words about was a, a, a data visualization we did this year uh, on London 2012. Um, Moet Stefano, myself, uh, some really talented guys called Studio Nand. Uh, and, and Garrett on, on infrastructure, Garrett Kaiser. And we basically analysed uh, social media, uh, Twitter, uh, during the Olympics for sentiment and tone. And we had three things. We had a real-time data visualisation, we were doing data journalism, and we had an installation. So we were basically running sentiment analysis on, on tweets uh, in, in real time, uh, picking out sort of key, sent key, key topics, analysing them for, for, for tone, and then basically created this uh, real-time interface, which is intended to be a, a counterpoint to uh, the Olympics themselves. Um, we had a lot of uh, ideas, and I should say that actually, talking about art projects, I ended up acting more as a curator because I had a festival to run. So a lot of this work is actually uh, Mike Stefan, incredibly talented data visualizer, and, and the NAND guys. But we originally played uh, with human form. Uh, and the idea that each tweet would be a particle forming those human figures. We ended up not doing it for two reasons. Number one, LOCOG's branding guidelines meant we couldn't do anything that looked like the beautiful little, uh, uh, little figures for the disciplines. And also, it was very difficult. It only worked at a certain scale. For very small numbers of tweets and very 
very high number, the, the metaphor broke down. So we came up with this visual language, these origami shapes to represent uh, different bandings uh, of sort of fairly positive to very positive, uh, fairly negative to very, ne very ne negative. And, in a, and you know, one aspect was you had a kind of a beauty contest, which were the most discussed topics in real time, um, and what was the character of the discussion, the emotional response. Um, and, and then afterwards we created a data sculpture uh, where we milled um, uh, uh, in a, a physical archive of the total emotional response. So each of those days, is, each of those, sorry, those bands is one day, the emotional response on, on, online uh, for one day. And then we, we projected on top of that um, the stories, what, what, what those features, those features in the landscape represented, what was the stories behind each of those. Um, and then on the wall we had this kind of long timeline. Uh, in addition to that, we were doing data journalism. Uh, we spent a lot of time sort of looking at the data, uh, pulling out key stories, looking at um, how they were received, and, and really sort of trying to get a perspective on, on, the, on the games you couldn't get through conventional media or other ways of reading the events. Um, that's the infrastructure, the back-end infrastructure. And, and uh, final point, um, it had some caveats. Uh, it, we were using Twitter. That's not global. This is um, the sort of concentration of, uh, of the geotag data we had, where it came from. So it wasn't uh, a true global representation, but it was, uh, it was certainly a, a reading of that uh, global network, and we hope a different way of experiencing the games. And uh, that's me. Thank you very much. So this is Steve Sims from the OWL Project. Yeah, it's Steve Simon. It's so. all right. Don't worry. I can't start. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> right. OWL Project. OWL Project is three people. Myself, uh, Steve Simons, yes, and Simon Blackmore and Tony Hall. Um, Simon and Tony can't be with us tonight because they're in the middle of a forest um, just off the A14 in a residency at the moment. And I was obviously given this job rather than going and enjoying the forest, but there we go. Um, <laughs> when we, <laughs> we all have uh, individual art practices. Um, this is a very boring photo for something which is very hard to represent. I'm known, when I'm not part of the art project, for making locative um, sound systems, and in particular locative 3D sound systems. So uh, I have a, back, uh, like, uh, a series of 3D surround sound backpacks that you walk around with, and as you walk around, sounds change, and uh, uh, depending on what you're doing. So we've got these normal walks. What I'm actually I tend to do is render your path, and uh, in, in in 3D sound, in relationship to everybody else's path. So the metaphor I use is: uh, imagine a field covered in snow, and you're the first person there, and you walk across it. You've got this perfect version, lovely, lovely little white noise kind of thing going on. And then as you're walking along. Someone else has been out a little bit earlier than you. They've got a dog, and they've gone across the field. And as you come walking up, you cross their path. Now, for a long time, I was trying to, well, how, do you, how can you represent a path that you cross in sound? Yeah, it's a line where I don't know where it starts. I don't know where it ends. Um, but I want to get the sense of you crossing this. And this is what's happening in the background, that um, as everyone moves around using my system, they get drawn in a very traditional GPS drawing map, but then pixels are taken out and rendered into sound. So that's the kind of thing I do when I'm not working with our project. The kind of thing Simon does when he's not working with our project is um, this is a project um, that investigated um, net radio, and it was a, there was a 3D world projected there, and you stood on this boat and you steered yourself through the 3D world. And as you drove around or sailed around, uh, different radio streams would, uh, would uh, fade in and fade out uh, and were located in 3D around you. Project over there is a, um, it's an L system used to grow a tree. So it takes the uh, an emergent system and then uses some uh, influential data. In this case, it was um, data traffic which then causes a tree to grow. Uh, it was drawn by um, a rep rap, which he built inside out, and then 
reprogrammed to uh, draw out very slowly this, uh, these light trees. Tony wears weird glasses. Um, Tony is uh, uh, Tony's interested in by art, and he's interested in connecting humans and animals, shall we say. In this case, it's a, um, a particular kind of electric fish. And as you sit wearing his glasses in his immersive environment, the signals from the fish get fed to you, your brain waves get picked up and get fed back to the fish. The fish then responds back to you. you, you uh, and these glasses are not particularly, they may look relaxing, but they're very stroboscopic and are not relaxing at all. Uh, which are, uh, he obviously is enjoying it. It's got quite a smile on his face. Bring us together, and we don't. We, we work with wood. We work <laughs> with wood and electronics, and we make weird sculptural instruments that we perform with. Um, it may seem a bit of a jar, uh, but our project is very strongly the mix of all three of us. So our individual creativity comes together, and this fourth thing then it comes out of it. And we're never quite sure where it comes from, um, but hey, we, we have some fun. These are uh, log one Ks. This is our answer to the laptop. This is when, um, <laughs> when uh, laptop music came apparent. You know, people got very, you, know, you go to class, people say the laptop laptops and the screen, and what are they doing? Well, we couldn't afford laptops, but we could afford logs. So we made our own instruments with logs. With the, like, the screen glows, Actually, I must say, very nice glowing screen there. There's a little wooden disc that spins, and you can build up rhythms and clicks and glitches from, uh, from the instrument as you play. The laptop, the lot is a bit big, you know. And then my Apple, they bring out the iPod, don't they? And we go, ooh, we want to make something small. So invariably, you know, our, the big logs got smaller. This is the iLog range. Uh, three of them. They're all called the iLog Russells, and this is uh, in there is a hacked sampler. And instead of having what was it, I don't know, 20 hours of sound or something, you've got 20 seconds, and you can record in real time with the red button. And then you've got a couple of nice knobs which you can use to control the sound. Uh, you can in fact rustle it and slow it down, and because it's a hacked electronics, it gets really granulated. <laughs> I uh, thought close up. You see, we really like this woody thing going on. Uh, we're very interested in crafts, and uh, a lot of what I've seen today on the uh, at the um, well, all the programming we've talked about. This is this direct correlation between very traditional crafts and modern technology, where people are building their own tools and they're invariably sharing their own tools. And we. Our, log, our project is very similar to this. That we keep on people ask us, "Come on, can I can have a log?" And we're like, "Well, each log takes us like a couple of days to hollow out. Then it takes. It's not really very practical for us to, to build and stuff." So our response was to make our, um, do what, do workshops where we invite people to come and well, they start the workshop, do they workshop? We give them a log and we say, "Right, we're going to make an instrument with this log." And they look at us, and then there's this really nice usability moment where they go. Oh, well, I play the guitar or I play the flute, so I want my sensors here or there or like this. So we then give them some knobs and some switches and some buttons and they lay it out and then we go through and we actually build the thing itself. The electronics this one was based on is um, a now defunct uh, thing I'm open source hardware project called the Muyo Interface, which, um, you know, if we're talking Arduino versus Muyo, one's Betamax, one's VHS. Uh, well, we'll leave it at that anyway. Um, <laughs> things stepped up a gear three years ago uh, for us when Ed Carter, who's a producer, a uh, creative producer and performer based in Newcastle, uh, performs as Winter North Atlantic, gave our project to Rang and said, I'd like to do a project with a water wheel on the Tyne, and I'd like it to pass some wild instruments. What would happen if you were involved? And we were like, oh, yeah, right, that's going to be massive. That's going to cost you like half a million pounds. And he goes, funny you should say that. Um, and there was, a, uh, there was an early bid for artists taking the lead, which was another cultural Olympics project. And we sat down and went, OK, what, what? well, let's have a water well. Now, this is actually a ship mill. 
and there was a technology that was all over Northern Europe a few hundred years ago. Mills to to, to um, get to actually get the power to mill your corn and to like build yourself a water wheel on land was a very political hard thing to do. But to get a but to float one out into the river where there was no like land you're generally going, oh, that's my land, uh, it was a lot easier. So, and you could also get a better, stronger flow. So uh, people started building ship mills. So there'll be a big mill and there'll be a mill house. So we started looking at, um, there's a few real still re working uh, in um, Eastern Europe. So we conceived this idea with Ed where you would come down the ramp this is an artist drawing by uh, Nicky Kirk, who's the architect we work with. And you would come in, and you'd stand next to this water wheel, and this water wheel would be big. And then when you go inside the building, you'd find some nice owl project style instruments, which are all responding to the river and responding to the chemical composition of the river. And this invariably led us to thinking, well, we're making quite small little things. Now we have to start thinking bigger. And the first thing that interested us is traditional ways of making gears and making mechanisms. And this is a shot of us trying out and building a few nice little lantern gears and getting the CNC out to start cutting logs. So we're very, we developed a whole new set of processes based on things starting in Blender, being designed, then being exported, going through a whole tidying up and coding process. And we, this was all the shape of all these gears is, comes from um, a coding in Python. And then it comes back through the CNC to a very hand, uh, um, handcrafted um, activity. Um, we, uh, this, this, this is about just under two meters long, about one meter eighty, and it is a 12 channel analog log. And I, love, oh, I never actually realized that pop that pump. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, there's Simon with a nice big log, yes. Um, it's like the other just a bit big. It's a 12-channel um, analog synthesizer, um, which plays the, date, the river, river data over a 12-year period. Um, we worked with a guy, Littrick Drew. And this is the outcome. Uh, flow. Uh, this was the building. It looks just like you drew it. I'm quite impressed with the people who built it. This wheel is four and a half meters by four and a half meters. So as you stand there, it dominates your experience. And it slowly turns one way as the tide comes in and turns the other way as the tide goes out. And it generates power to drive the machinery which is inside. Um, so we built this big machine. It's about three meters tall. It's six meters long, two and a half meters wide. And it responds to the river. Every hour, every half hour, water was pumped up and fed down to a series of jars to do different things. Analyze, the water was analyzed in a different way. Uh, we looked at the nitrates, we looked at how salty the river was, we looked at how murky, how dirty the river was. And there was a different machine that responded to uh, each one. Do I have time to show a bit of a video? Yeah, we'll just do the video and then the video. Yeah, and then that's me. Uh, <laughs> this is all a bit corporate, I feel, the video. But anyway, anyway we've got enough for production. Uh, play? Is that playing? Oh, you want the audio? You promised the audio. So this is the, um, this is the Salinity Seek Group sampler. Um, uh, it'll be easier to sort of voice over. People coming on and enjoying the river. This is the wheel. <laughs> That's someone operating on the controls. It was there for six months. We could drive it six months. Actually, can we pause it? Yeah, sure. Oh. Thanks. Right, okay, this is the... Um, every... Tw uh, how do I operate this thing? Mouse is gone. Is it completely powered by the river? Okay. Yeah, the, um, the river, yes. We only used what we could generate. Right. Unfortunately, the batteries were dropped down, so we had to have some solar power to keep them top. Uh, self-contained. Yeah, yeah, we tried to keep the whole thing self-contained. Um, this instrument you've been looking at plays 
every half, every Arab takes a sample of river water and puts it into a jar, a little nice wooden conveyor belt which moves along. And then each of the arms you saw dripping in, they take the saltiness of the river and turn it into a tone based on how, how, uh, how salty it is. And then it goes to this uh, a ch one channel on the analog synth, so you can then control um, the known duration of a note and stuff. So, boom, boom, boom. So it's a sequencer based on the river. Uh, the f this is actually on our website, so you can have a look at it there. With lots of moving gears and things. Scanning lasers, this was scanning how dirty, to test how dirty the river was. Every time the laser hit a particle, it made a piece of, <laughs> made some noise. And above your head were the three very large bellows. I mean, like this, each one weighs like 45, 50 kilos, which would be slow lift up and then would drop with a bang, which would push air into these big resonating chambers. The level of the water was controlled by um, chemical composition of the river. So uh, the amount of resonance that happened and the sound you, which was synthesized. Um, whole argument about do we give the audience control as well? So we allowed a certain amount of um, audio uh, 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 control of the machines by the uh, audience. Uh, there you go. You can watch it online, flowmill.org, uh, or just do a search. Okay, that's all right. Thank you.